Hey guys, it's Brendan. Okay, so you mean to tell me that for the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, the show where I speak with the world's best artists about how they go about creating works of nonfiction, I get to read books, essays, articles, listen to radio, watch documentaries, and then I get to talk to them about all that? That's a thing? Okay. Am I lucky or what? Lay down the rest. Yeah, baby. It's episode 52 of the aforementioned Creative Nonfiction Podcast. Thanks for listening. This one is a bit special because I've got New York Times sports writer Joe Drake, the best-selling author of American Pharaoh, the untold story of the Triple Crown winner's legendary rise. What better guest to have on the eve of the Belmont Stakes? Oh, and for those of you who don't know, the Belmont Stakes is the third race for three-year-old thoroughbred horses, deemed the Triple Crown. It starts with a race you've heard of, the Kentucky Derby, then the Preakness Stakes, and at last it ends in New York for the Belmont. I'm going to go to the whip here and ask, ask for those reviews. They're coming in and making a really, really nice impact. Let's keep them coming. I'm deeply thankful to all who have contributed so far. So uh, beyond that, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Share this with a pen pal. And let's just keep encouraging each other. So now here's the eternally quotable, as you will find, Joe Drape. Let's rock and roll this. I mean, I, you appreciate this. After after I'm done with you, I make a couple calls, and then I go down to Rockefeller Center and drink some beers for the draw. Oh man, that's uh, <laughs> that's always fun. That yes, is, it is. <laughs> so let's say uh, so. Getting you know, we'll we'll go back to the year 2015 just to to, to kick things off. And I, I want wanted you to like, so maybe give us a little sense of what it was like heading to Belmont Park on that June day in 2015 with that buzz of this American Pharaoh could actually be the horse to finally get it done. Brendan, it, it is a trip I've made nine times, I believe, on that June Saturday when a horse has won two of three and the place is alive thinking, hey, we could have another triple crown. And I started sitting in that press box in 98. So in 98, it had been 20 years since Affirmed had swept the Triple Crown. And as I kept going out there for Funny Side, for Affirmed, War Emblem, uh, you know, count them down, I, Smarty Jones, I was beginning to feel like, hey, this, this was never going to happen, that too many things had changed. There were too many factors involved now that made it too difficult. And I had definitely tempered my expectations of ever witnessing a triple crown. And, you know, I, for better or worse, I said to my editors, I said, man, all I want to do is see it, write the front page story, because I had edited a collection of horse race writing from the times of their 150 years back in like 2008. And, you know, in those days, in the beginning of time, I mean, horse racing was front page news every day, not just the Triple Crown. Right. But the Triple Crowns were above the fold. Uh, you know, you had bylines like Red Smith on it, Steve Cady, Steve Chris. And I said, you know, I, I, I want to do that and then I'll finish my tenure as the racing rider. So, you know, that is the way I wanted to go out to that that day, you know, tempered expectations. But this one was a little better, and I'll get into that later. You know, he had a little more high hopes there. When uh, he turned for home, and he was three, four links ahead, and it was clear nobody was catching him, and just the soul-quaking cheer that went up in that place. And, you know, I've been blessed to be at a lot of sporting events as a fan and as a journalist, Super Bowls, Olympics, prize fights, championship, basketball, World Series. I've never heard a cheer that was so unified, so moving, because at that moment, everybody in the place was rooting for the same thing. And that same thing was for him to win the Belmont, sweep the Triple Crown. And it was sort of a selfish sort of bellow and uh, 
prayer to the gods because we were seeing greatness and we were achieving history and we were a part of it. We were there. We were seeing it. And so that is where I decided, okay, you know, I, I kind of allude to that in this story. But then the next morning I wake up and I thought, you know, there's a book here and here's why there's a book is because uh, it's a moment of achievement in history we don't see often anymore in any sport or really kind of in, you know, any history. I'll keep it to sports. The only other sporting moment I saw this unifying is when uh, the Americans beat the Russians in hockey Mm. at Lake Placid. I mean, that was a thing that if you didn't know anything about hockey, and at the time I didn't, you were still deeply moved by it. And I think that's what American Pharaoh's Triple Crown did. It, it, It appealed to people who didn't know much about horse racing, but knew they had seen something achieved that was rare and that was, you know, up there that that was special and that was the one motivation the second was you know for better or worse i've spent tens of thousands of dollars at the betting windows and owning horses and being around horses for 40 plus years that i have a lot of what my dad used to call useless information about horse racing i know a lot about the sport uh i've been in breeding sheds you know, I've seen horses fold. I've seen them trained. I, you know, no owners. I know jockeys. I know low life uh, gambler types. Uh, I know the world very well. And I thought, okay, this is a chance to tell a story that I think needs to be telling and to really exercise out of myself all this useless information I've accumulated over the years and to really, you know, please myself and tell a story with every tool in my toolbox and you know it's the one and only project ever i'm going to be able to start with the sex scene and that's what i did is you know (laughs) american pharaoh's mom and dad at the moment of conception which you know in itself is a fascinating moment that i would learned over the years you know that this violent minute and a half mating and this dance and ritual with five guys in flak jackets and helmets and holding you know the stallion's penis up and a, yep. and a test tube to make sure he ejaculated so you can show the insurance company all on videotape and all worth a several, mil- several million dollars. I mean, that is something I knew I could bring to a uh, general audience. So that, that was the motivation of the book. Uh, it was a joy to write, actually, uh, and I, I've written six now. And I can't say that about all of them, but this one was a joy to write. Uh, It just seemed like my moment and my time. And, you know, this had a built-in audience. And as anybody who's written books or done movies or documentaries, I mean, we can all pour our soul into these projects, and we do. But whether it becomes Seabiscuit or Black Maestro, which was another book of mine nobody really has heard of, is all up to the fates and if it finds an audience. So, you know, that's all you can do is your best and throw it out there. And this one had a built in audience and, you know, I've been fortunate enough. It's a New York times bestseller a national bestseller has gone to several printings. So, you know, I'm, I'm pleased with how it's all worked out. Uh, That's great. Cause the, the the book is fantastic and it's, it's a real, it's a great tribute to that. Not that you wrote it like in service of, like it's still a great piece of journalism, and it's not like you wrote it as just like a puff piece to American Pharaoh. But it is a great tribute to a horse that, when he won, he won in style, and he only lost you know the one time in his three year old year, and then one time in his two year old year. But like every, especially that Belmont Stakes and then his Breeders' Cup Classic, it was just like this horse is, he truly is like one for the ages and you were able to capture that so well well and i appreciate that and i remember telling my editor he said how are you going to do this book and i said you know what it's a biography of a horse as silly as that sounds but if you go look back at all the books that have worked about horses and horse racing uh national velvet sea biscuit far lap uh secretariat You had to keep your eyes on the horse and the horse. Yes, it's an animal, but it has in racing, especially a life cycle. 
and a certain uh, evolution it has to take. And what's fascinating is if you keep that on the through line, then you figure out all the lives it's changed, all the people whose hands were on the horse, who basically, you know, had their lives changed by their sometimes brief or sometimes long association with them. And they were able to help me tell the story. I mean, it was, their story was his story and vice versa. And so, you know, it ended up being a very good uh, device to drive the narrative about, you know, the, the luck, the magic and the talent that has to go into things like this. Yeah. And it, it's it's great that you brought up luck, too, because. I feel like as as talented and as brilliant as that horse was, and truly a a fast horse for uh, for all time, he got real lucky throughout every every race in the Triple Crown. And it was, you know, whether it was Kentucky Derby drawing outside and then you know avoiding traffic and then getting the rail in the Preakness, but then it rains, so he gets the mud and gets hustled out. And then in the Belmont, all the speed horses scratched, so he had no pressure out front. So it was like the stars truly aligned and then he was gifted enough to close the deal. Uh, no doubt, Brendan. And to me, the, the takeaway, and that's why I'm not surprised. We're coming up to this Belmont stakes. I just saw classic empire scratch this morning with an abscess. Uh, you know, it's going to be a no name bunch of horses. The Derby winner's not here. Always dreaming. The Preakness winner is not here. Cloud computing. You know, it's going to be 13 decent three year olds. Uh, and I think that's going to be more the rule than the exception as we go forward. You know, my biggest takeaway, just as a handicapper, a horse fan, a chronicler of horse racing, mm-hmm. is that three things are needed. Talent, talent, and talent. Mm-hmm. American Pharaoh was no secret to anybody. At two years old, before he'd even hit the track, they were talking about him at Del Mar and at Santa Anita and his workouts. He was incredibly an efficiently moving machine. And that goes back to when he was a four month old, when he was on the farm and Francis Relihan, the farm manager, was out weaning, was, he was in the process of weaning from his mother. And then he was just a little Princess Emma cult, that's what they called him. And she's out on an evening run and she sees him in a field bucking and swirling and then he takes off and she stops and it takes her breath away. And this is a woman who grew up on a farm in Ireland, seen tens of thousands of horses. And she said, I had never seen one move so beautifully and efficiently. Uh, he was perfectly engineered, Brendan. He had not, no turn-ins, no turn-outs. He was balanced, muscular. You see this throughout. You see it in, uh, and you know, for your horse-inclined people out there, Go to YouTube, look up American Pharaoh and the McCathans, M-C-K-A-T-H-A-N-S, and you see his workout as a two-year-old when they're showcasing them. And it's only an eighth of a mile, but he quiets Mr. Zayat, his owner, and every other trainer around him because they have never seen anybody at any age run that efficiently and that fast it really blows them away so you know talent is the deal uh the magic and the luck are one and the same a little bit you mentioned all the lucky factors that happened during the races but the magic which is part of that luck is victor espinoza won bob baffert's first choice or second choice he was his fifth choice everybody Mm -hmm. baffert wanted to get on this horse uh had other commitments. Gary Stevens was getting his knee replaced. Didn't want to get on him. Martin Garcia, the one who lost to him on his first race, lost with him in his first race, didn't like him, didn't want to get back on him. And Victor and Bob had had a falling out years ago. Uh, and it was after they had already won two thirds of the triple crown with war of them. Right. They just kind of went sour on each other. And that happens. And you know, two days out, he's sitting there without a rider for this horse. And he says, you know, Victor was on War Emblem and did really well. And War Emblem was a hard, vicious horse. So let me give him a call. And, you know, Victor's as surprised as anybody who gets it. But, you know, gets up two days later, knows it's his derby horse and beyond, and makes his amends. And without Victor, you think about the, the things I'm going to just compliment what you were saying. The Derby, 
he got a lot of heat for hitting that horse 31 times down the stretch. But he had done two things to get him ready for that moment. It, three weeks before at the Arkansas Derby, he had held him back and made him take dirt in his face. And before that, he had always gone to the front and just, you know, pissed on people. Mm -hmm. uh, he knew going to the Derby that he was going to get behind horses, that he would face trouble. And he needed to get a little seasoned about it, get used to it. And as he said, he goes, I'd rather lose the second Saturday in April than the first Saturday in May. So he does that. And then he went to the well on that horse. And, you know, that was a tough derby. That was his toughest race probably in his career. He uh, yeah. was only a length or so ahead of the time. And that was with Victor, who's not, you know, usually that strong of a rider, taking both of them out of their comfort zone to get, to get the victory. Yeah, I think it, he had uh, American Pharaoh had won all his races so easily up until that point that like he almost needed the Derby as a as a prep race for the next two races in the Triple Crown. Like he needed the fitness boost uh, of that, you know, a real like he needed to go to battle for in in a in a race finally. And he was he was that talented to hold off firing squad and the monster Dortmund, and um, and still you know and then came back a couple. A couple weeks later and he was still like oh yeah he was you know still full of himself and actually got a boost instead of being drained out of the out of the derby no absolutely and you see that happen with the really good ones uh you know classic empire was is not an american pharaoh but he had a tough derby and a lot of trouble and was a little short on fitness because they were playing catch up on injuries and you saw that tough battle in the Derby show up in the Preakness, even though he couldn't hold off cloud computing, he ran a big race. He ran a race, a winning race. So yeah, the Derby often becomes sort of that moment of truth where you figure out who's meant for this, who's, who's fits this, who can do this. And, uh, that's what happened with Pharaoh. So now what, what also impresses me the most about what you're able to do with this book was it, it basically it comes out 11 months after the uh, after the he wins the triple crown and so you were able to craft this craft this book over the course of less than a year and get it packaged and and published in under a year's time so I, I really wanted to dive into how you were able to accomplish that and, and pull that off like like when did when did the book research officially start for you and even the book writing because i imagine some things had to go like congruently so you could meet a deadline you know a couple things i'm uniquely and there's anybody who a is a newspaper journalist and b especially a sports writer you gotta be fast you've written on deadline all your life uh you know how to take out your internal audit system and, you know, when you got 10 minutes to write the Derby story, you just got to let it rip. You can't really sit there and think about it and craft that heavily. So those are the fundamental tools that I bring to these things. And there's mainly all but one book I've done on quick turnarounds. Uh, so that's uh, I have this skill set that I can do that. As I tell my wife is, you know. I may not write well, but I write fast, and yeah. <laughs> uh, and it does and it does, you know. I'm free. I'm okay with that. And there are people who are far better writers and far better reporters, and some are far more tortured, and some take far tort longer, and that's okay too. Everybody works within their system, and since this is about the creative process, you know, that's the first thing you got to do is figure out who you are and what works for you. Uh, I read something. Now I'm going to digress a little bit because it kind of perfectly sets this up. Please. Dan, Dan Jenkins had wrote his uh, memoir, his latest memoir, a year or two ago. And he's a guy that I started in, on the Texas circuit, and I got to meet a couple times. And But he says in his memoir, he talks about him and Gary Smith, who's the other uh, another great Sports Illustrated writer. But he... He figures in the deep dive. You know, he goes and spends uh, three months with John Cheney at, over at, at Temple with Bobby Knights and tries to get in their head and everything. And he talks about that. And he said, you know, I'm the kind of guy who 
likes to get a feel for something and an impression and then just roll with it. He goes, Gary spends a lot of time with people and really gets under their skin. And I love reading it, but I just don't like doing that. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, those are two schools of thought. And we both know people who are each way. You know, I would like to think that I'm in the middle of it. Uh, I do my reporting. I think all good uh, non, what do they call it? Non-fiction narrative. What's the fancy word they call it now? Long form, whatever yeah. that bullshit yeah. is. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it's all driven by reporting. Okay, right. you've got to know your stuff. All right. And then what works for you is, you know, for this book in particular, I feel like the reporting started when I first made my first bet at Axer Ben in Omaha, Nebraska hmm. in the 70s. You know, uh, I had a base of knowledge that I just built on over the years. So that's when it started. I went through the Triple Crown and we're all covering it, the Triple Crown. So, you know, I, I knew the players. I mean, I knew Bob Bafford for 20 years. I've known uh, Victor for 15. I know Ahmed Zayat for 10. You know, these were not strangers to me. These are people who, for better or worse, would talk to me. And we had all had our falling ins and falling outs over the years. So, you know, I'm up to speed there. But then after it's done, that's when you got to go back and identify the Francis Relihans who had him on the farm, the McCathens. And you do that by reading all your uh, contemporaries, you know, c- competitors, whatever you want to call them, uh, Pat Forty at Yahoo, Tim Layden at Sports Illustrated, the Louisville guys, because none of us can be everywhere during the Triple Crown. We all try to go do what we think is right for the story we got to write for tomorrow. And, you know, when I went back and read all that, I was like, wow, that's an interesting slice. Did that happen? And then you go back and you re-report it and talk to them and try to tease a little more out. So, that was a good, you know, several month uh, process. Uh, then you find some more stuff on your own. You tease that out. And the way I work is I can't write as I report and write in sections and say, okay, I'm going to write here. I've gotten this much done and I'm going to write this chapter. Uh, some people do that. Some writers I've really admired do that. I just don't think like that. And I need everything amassed in front of me. I need to know that, okay, I'm cutting off the reporting now, and I am sitting down to write. And outline-wise, what I try to do is I'm not even – I'm ADD enough that I can't even outline the whole friggin' book. You know, I try to outline the first three chapters and say, okay – this is where I'm going here. These are the three things and these anecdotes and incidents go here. And then I start writing because I feel like if you get too wrapped into a outline, you miss some discovery because sometimes you're writing and something thinks something, you think of something else and you start tapping a little more and it leads you a whole different alley. And then you go back and you say, yeah, you know, that would work here too. That would work better, in fact. Hmm. So then you start kind of picking what you do. So, you know, I want to have a decent mastery of the material. I want to know what I know. And when you first sit down, and again, these are all things I've read from other people and I've adopted it on my own. I'm no writing guru, but I'm like you. I'm a guy who's looked and listened and asked and had great mentors. Somewhere along the way, somebody said, you're ready to write when you can sit down and start typing without looking at your notes. And there's a certain truth to that. So, you know, yes, you look at your notes at some point when you, you need to go back on something. But, you know, there could be days and weeks where I could keep going without my notes. Uh, and that's you got to be comfortable with doing that, too. So. You know, that's where I do. I I get it all together to where I think I have a good handle on the material. And then I sit down and, uh, you know, my sister, my older sister, gave me a great children's rhyme 15, 20 years ago that I tell myself. 
inch by inch, life's a cinch, yard by yard, life is hard. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> instead of when you say, okay, I got six weeks to write 80,000 words, that freaks you out. It freaks anybody out. But if you get up and you say, okay, I'm going to do 1,500 today, and you go and you lay out your 1,500, and sometimes 1,500 goes to 3,000 or 6,000. Sometimes 1,500 becomes 300, and you shut your computer and go to a movie. You know? Uh, yeah. Days happen like that. Nobody, you know... I, I once read that Stephen King sits down and can write 5,000 words in an hour with rock and roll music blasting. And great, God bless him. I, I can't do that. But, uh, you know, if you find what system works, so that's what's the system that works with me, uh, is you sit down, you feel like you've mastered your material, you're a couple chapters ahead or a couple uh, beats in the story, and, you know, it's some, I hope we get to storytelling and because, you know, I'm a huge believer that you've got to be a little bit like a, a novelist, a, a screenwriter, and you have to have beats and set pieces and a beginning, middle and an end and an all is lost moment and, you know, a rousing finish. I think that's just part of the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, and in fact, that's... My son's in sixth grade, uh, you know, in the beginning of sort of intense English. He's parochial educated, as I was. And they sent down, sent home, the English teacher is obviously very good, sent home a seven-page, you know, broken down Joseph Campbell's myths and a hero's journey. And I snapped it out of his folder and I made a copy for myself because it's just a simple, you know, the totem, it just lays out. I mean, you look at Star Wars, look at the comic book movies. Those are all Joseph Campbell remade with different characters, but all the elements are there. And, you know, in a lot of ways, a lot of stories are like that. So, you know, I think that's a big deal. So you kind of work through your, uh, your what's propelling you to tell the story. And then I read another thing recently. Do you know who Tom Verducci is at Sports Illustrated? Uh, yes, definitely know the name, familiar with his work, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, he, and I don't know him, but he's a baseball guy and probably the Roger Kahn of this era, just a tremendous baseball. And I'm not a huge fan, but I'll read him because he tells me more than I know about baseball. And he wrote, he's got a book out right now, The Cubs Way, about the Cubs winning the World Series. Uh, and he wrote... 140,000 words in basically eight weeks. And that's amazing. And But somebody who's done close to that, or not close, half of that, but knows how it does. But he said something that I, I so know the feeling. He goes, you get to the point near, it's a look for me, it's a little past halfway where you know you've got it figured out and you're really sorry it's going to end soon. Mm. And, and, you know, he said, he goes, I, I was starting to get regret. And you kind of slow down because you don't want it to end. You hit your, your, you know, let's put it in horse uh, racing parlance. You know, when those guys, when those trainers say he has a high cruising speed. Yeah. You know, you've hit your high cruising speed. You are on the backstretch just galloping them to death, you know. You're in the zone. You're you're well within yourself, and that eventually happens when you that. And uh, you know, yeah, I know this is sort of a long-winded way to tell you, but that's kind of how I work, and these are the feelings I have while I'm doing it. Oh, that's great. That's a great way of putting it. And I and I, I was quickly doing the math for you know you gave you, you had eighty thousand words in six weeks, so that was like to, uh, tw about a little over twenty two hundred words. Like if you engineer it backwards, and you're like, okay, that. 2,000, you know, that's a long feature a day. You could say maybe even like a 1,000 words in the morning, 1,000 in the afternoon. And, like, you're, you know, when you break it down, the inch by inch you were saying, it, it doesn't seem quite as daunting. And it's just as long as you stick to your schedule and stick to your beats, find that cruising speed. Yeah, you, like people like you and Verducci and other folks can, can really tackle um, what looks like a monumental project in a very short amount of time. 
Well, and, and you know, here to tell you, I'll tell you, I'll speak for me. I also have a full time job and a 12 year old I got to put through high school and college. So, <laughs> you know, I have some power motive, powerful motivations to write quickly, well, and use my time well because. For any of my books, I've never taken a book leave. I mean, you know, people do and can. Uh, I've never felt like I needed it or was in a position where I was not going to cash a check while I was doing it. So that's amazing. Uh, you know, and again, people do things differently. There's no, and I, I, I know you've done 50 of these, talk to all kinds of people. I hope the through line is there's no right or wrong way to do any of this stuff. It's just your way. And, of course. And you got to be comfortable doing it your way. Yeah, and that's what's it's what's great about talking with a wide swath of people is that, you know, for anyone for anyone listening and interested, they can like maybe cherry pick, you know, from this person, this person and build and kind of like build your own routine and be like, "Oh, that what Joe said about that, you know, digesting uh, digesting the the monumental work in a short amount of time. Like that's great. Like it broke it down into manageable pieces and then you know, this other part, like, well, let's talk a little bit about storytelling and scene building and maybe when when you knew you know you have enough research to then, you know, build those narrative blocks of scene that propel you through through this book and, and so forth. So exactly. It's cherry picking that thing. But let's let's talk a little bit about storytelling, because that, that's really that's ultimately why people will pick up an American Pharaoh who might not be like a horse racing person and like want to follow it through to the very end well and you know it's in anything it's in all news news stories features magazines long forms whatever you want to call them you know especially this is something the times has taught me or being at the times has taught me is okay nobody picks up the new york times for sports i'm i'm okay with that i get that but we need to invite them in when they're looking for Trump news or economics or foreign. You try to a come up with a story that's going to intrigue them enough to go past the headline. B pull them in with a lead that's going to say, "Huh," and then hopefully keep them with you. And you do that by storytelling. And uh, you know that's what I've learned to work with is. I am not at Sports Illustrated where sports heads are going to come read just because it's Sports Illustrated. So, you know, with American Pharaoh, the storytelling, and I talk, talked about set pieces. I started with the sex scene because it encompassed, first, it gave a look at a world nobody really ever sees, you know, how this happens. I mean, besides the true genesis of the story, this is what happens in the actual act this is the money at stake so you've got sex money and rock and roll right there but you know what basically you brought people into a behind the scenes thing that matters that makes a lot of money so you don't have to be a horse fan there you just have to be curious about hey you know how do horses make and how do they get to this point how much money is involved? So, you know, you, you've got to start, you know, it's the old thing. And it's what you said in the last sequence. Everybody cherry picks something. And I urge you and anybody else out there, look up Elmore Leonard's Rules of Writing. And it was, I think the magazine, Times Magazine ran it. It's maybe 1,500 words. It's like 15 rules. And the first one is leave all the boring stuff out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really succinct, and it's really about uh, showing, not telling. And to do that, you have to move. You do have to be a screenwriter in a sense. And that's another form I mess around with and have sold a couple and I'm trying to do more of. you got to pull people through with scenes and visuals and put them in the room or in the barn or out in the field or at the racetrack. And it's basic, the show don't tell. And, you know, Elmore does it far more entertainingly than I do. But it's really an essential piece of, uh, of writing to look up and keep on because it, it really breaks down what this is all about. And he says it in his funny way. So, you know, the storytelling, you got to follow your, your manuscript there. Uh, 
there's a guy I know who is a producer friend of mine. He did My Left Foot, among other things, won a Tony, won a Oscar. And I was messing around with a play once, and he's done a bunch of Broadway plays, an Irish fellow named Noel Pearson. And I said, you know, what's the secret of writing a play? And he goes, you have to have a good ending. And mm. sometimes advice is that simple. And you do have to think about not overthinking anything. You know, it's like telling a story like you would be telling your kid at night or around the campfire when you were a kid or, you know, standing up in front of 2,000 people in a speaking engagement. Uh, storytelling, I think, trumps all other uh, forms of, or all other parts of the equation. There's beautiful, eloquent writers. Uh, there's wonderful thinkers. Uh, and these are all parts of it. And, you know, there's great sentence architects. But unless you've got a story people want to stay with, none of those components really matter. Did you ever, like getting... Getting back to the to the writing, when you were you know feverishly writing you know thousands of words a day, what was and a, 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 and what you alluded to with Verducci, like having to slow down? Like, did you reach a point like towards the end of the writing where you had to step back and slow down and savor it because you know it was in fact coming to an end? Oh yeah, absolutely, there is, and uh, you know that's that's the perfect writing project. You want that uh, when people come to me who friends who are working on or are thinking about writing their book, usually first time books, and you know ask for advice. And I, I say, you know, the first thing is you better really love your subject and be passionate about it because otherwise it's work. And you know, books written for money or on a whim read like books written for money or on a whim. Right. You know. You you got to stay with it. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, a lot of thought, a lot of time goes into it. You know, basically with no real guaranteed payoff. I mean, you get an advance, could be a little, could be a lot, but that's basically all you need to count. All you can really count on is your advance money. Uh, you know, James Patterson, John Grisham. Those guys make royalties out the wazoo, but the rest of us don't. You, when you get to that point where, and it's not just, it's not, you don't want to slow down to savor. You're just thinking, wow, you know, I, I've got it now. And I, I'm sorry. It, it becomes easy. And that's the greatest moment when, you know, your 1,500 becomes 4,000 passages in a half a day. Mm. Uh, and you're like, you know, I'm clicking on all cylinders and, uh, you know, when I write, it's interesting when you write news stories too, especially more complicated enterprise things. I spend, and the same is with book. I spend seventy percent of my time on the first five hundred words than I do, and the rest is for the next fifteen hundred, because you have to have it set up correctly. You have to have it already to draw it in and then it starts clicking in place like Legos on that. Mm. And when I go back and when I do books, the most like, uh, when I go back on drafts, most of my lifting goes on the first two or three chapters because you're so tight. I, a, I'm a newspaper guy. So I'm used to packing it all in, in, you know, very telegraph compact ways. So it takes me a couple weeks to unpack my language, to realize that I have a lot of time and a lot of space to tell the story more completely and more slowly. And, uh, you know, that's just shaking off muscles. It's like a sprinter having to run the two mile. It's going to yeah. take you a little bit to figure it out. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's things you kind of work your way through. Right, and you, you know, you had mentioned Dan Jenkins as a as a as a book writer that, and uh, and even in with uh, newspapers and magazines, like growing up as a formative influence. Uh, who were so? What were some other formative you know books and and writers that as you were coming up and and uh, earning your stripes that uh, influenced your style and made you want to keep doing what you were doing? 
I was a kid who loved to read to the point where I'd go to bed with a flashlight, pull the head over mm -hmm. my covers, and sit there and read. And I read anything and everything. Uh, the newspaper, uh, the sports section especially. I lived in Kansas City. There's a morning and afternoon edition. I read the Chip Hilton books. I read the Hardy Boy books. Uh, I had older brothers, and they started handing down more challenging material. Uh, the one, the two that I remember, the two first like adult books I remember, one was sports, which was Ball Four, which was Jim Bouton, the pitcher, on basically locker room hijinks. I mean, it was scandalous at the time. Now it would be very tame. And then my older brother gave me a book by Thomas McGuane called 92 in the Shade. And it's about a fishing guide down in Florida and a young guy. And it's a beautifully elegiac written book. And Thomas McGuane's a guy I've devoured all his books since. Uh, and Thomas McGuane led me to Jim Harrison, who recently died, who, for my money, is the best American novelist I've read in my lifetime. He has uh, written poems, he cooked, he had this gusto for life, he wrote novellas which were tremendous, Legends of the Fall, the movies based on that, one of his novellas, and he's a must read there because he's very earthy and he's a great storyteller. The two things that kind of got me, that I didn't know at the time that got me going into this deal is one summer when I was 13 or 14, I don't know what I did, but I got in trouble. And instead of grounding me for the summer, my mother said, you know what? Here's your grounding. You're going to read the great books this summer. And, you know, I'm dating myself. At that time, the great books was this little collection, you know, in a hard sleeve. They collected in paperbacks, and it was Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, The Jungle Book, Treasure Island, La Morte d'Arthur you know, the classics. And I read them through the summer and just loved them. I thought it was just great uh, storytelling. It put me in a world and be what kids are finding in those Hunger Game books now and that kind of thing. And so that kind of confirmed that I could read, that I, and I enjoyed it. And then when I went to high school, I went to a Jesuit, all boys Jesuit, and I had two guys, Father Dave Bishop, who when we were sophomores, put the list of the 500 most underused words, according to New York Times Magazine, up on the board. And every day we had a quiz on 20 of them. And it expanded our vocabulary and kind of got me interested in words. And then my senior year, I had a teacher named Jim Hyman who made us read Canterbury Tales, Shakespeare, uh, you know, basically the classics again. And he was a wonderful teacher. So it, the emphasis was always on storytelling. What what were they trying to do? What was the knight's tale about? And so reading and writing just kind of became something I'd loved doing without thinking about it. I mean, I didn't think I was going to be a writer. It just most people were freaked out by papers. I was okay with them. I could write a paper. It, it didn't bother me. And... Uh, I went to college at SMU in Dallas, Texas, and was an English major with a emphasis in creative writing. And I had a very good uh, professor there named Marshall Terry, who has a great backstory. He went to Kenyon College and was in the same class with E.L. Doctorow and Paul Newman. Wow. So he's, so he's like the third most famous guy and had written novels, really well-received novels. And a really a nice, gentle guy and was really a great teacher. And he basically gently nudged me without saying, there's no way you're going to be a novelist. He said, you have a great eye for things and you can tell a story. If I were you, I would think about uh, nonfiction, narrative nonfiction. Mm. And that was the, the nudge my way. Now, I didn't really know what that meant or how I was going to do it. And all of a sudden I've graduated from college and I needed a job and I'm a worthless English major, more or less. And 
you know, another older brother of mine had worked at the Kansas City Star and had gone on into the business of journalism. He said, you know, you ought to apply to newspapers. So first I came up to New York and freelanced for a year and applying at newspapers every week. And I convinced there's resumes of mine still in post office boxes at the smallest papers in America who had just never answered me. You know, you just sent them there. Uh, I did get an interview at the Dallas Morning News one day, and I flew down there, and the guy who was supposed to see me had broke his tooth at lunch, and I'm sitting in his office, and I heard his secretary go out and catch the executive editor and said, you know, this guy was supposed to see Ralph. Let's find somebody to give him 10 minutes and to move him on. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I hear this. I've been rejected widely everywhere. And so they send the city editor, editor in, a guy named Stu Wilk, and, you know, Stu says quite rightly, we don't really hire anybody unless they have two to five years experience at a Metro Daily of 200,000 or more, and uh, I'm sorry. And I said, look, this isn't rocket scientist. I was pissed and I was a little lippy. I was like, you know, I've written all my life. This isn't hard. You're making a mistake. All I need is a shot. He huh. said, you know, thanks, great. Still move me on out. I'm heading to the airport the next morning, and uh, he calls at about 7.30, and he says, look, I liked your fire. Here's what I'll do. I'll give you a job for six bucks an hour, no benefits. Uh, after eight months, you're either we're either hiring you here full time or you have a stack of clips to take somewhere else. And I jumped at it. I started at night cops, 6 to 2.30 in the morning, uh, listening to scanners, going out on murders and stuff, and uh, then worked my way through the metro desk, 4 to 1 in the morning, 1 to 10, 10 to 7, and, you know, basically crawled and then walked before I was ever really allowed to run. And I think, you know, I, I came up very much the old school way that you – started in the cop shop and you did Plano school board meetings and you did the bus routes and you did weather stories. Uh, you got the fundamentals first. So that's, that's kind of what led, uh, me to writing professionally. It evolved into a job as a national correspondent at the Atlanta constitution, which was a great gig. Uh, I lived in North Carolina and had from Florida to New York. Uh, and really what kind of got me to the times and transformed me to sports was I was 1988. The Charlotte Hornets were their first year in the NBA. Uh, I, like everybody, had read another formidable book in sports, The Breaks of the Game by David Halberstam, yep. which, tra yep. which tracked uh, – the Bill Walton Portland Trailblazers championship season. And it was, you know, the, the template was there. You follow a team, you examine the personalities, you've got your built in beginning, middle and end. I was down there. The Hornets were just starting. They were an awful expansion team, but this was a new South city. And, you know, I saw a Halberstamian <laughs> type opportunity somehow sold a proposal, uh, wrote an absolutely awful book. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, I remember I, the first time trying to do it fast. I remember it was due in September and then like July 1st, I had seven double stage space pages and had no idea what to do. And fortunately, again, my older brothers had some experience and they came down and talked me through an outline and kept me on a schedule and uh, you know it's it is what it is it's on remander bins everywhere right now but what that did was right after that atlanta got to 96 olympics and the paper said we need somebody who's familiar in sports but has a news background to be our lead olympic writer and so that I moved to Atlanta, became that guy, and that guy was able to go to South Africa and for six months to write a series, was able to go to the 
declining Soviet Union was allowed to go all over the world to do these kind of stories. And, you know, that caught the Times notice. I'm especially impressed by by that early the early like hustle and like belief that you had like in yourself and in the face of trying to get that first job. And uh, do you find that a lot of people just don't sort of have that muscle or don't have that spine and willing to do that kind of work to, you know, maybe eventually 15, 20 years down the road, get to a high profile, uh, high profile market? Like, do you, do you feel people are lacking in that, that degree of hustle these days? You know, that's a nuanced, I'm going to try to be nuanced on that answer. Okay, when young people call and say, you know, what can I do? And the first thing I say is, you've got to stay in people's face. I mean, you and I have been trying to do this podcast for a bunch of times. Okay? Yeah. And I've wanted to do it, but then... Things stack up, you know, right. things happen. And unless you keep coming back and saying, let's do it, I'm not going to do it. And it's not because I'm dissing you or the podcast. It's just you go to the bottom of my inbox and I forget about it. All yeah. right. <laughs> and that's that's what I tell young people. I was like, you know, it's not enough to just send clips and a resume. You got to stay on people. You got to make them feel bad. you got to you got to stay in their face now that's a hard thing to do. You got to be willing to, you know, eat rejection morning, noon, and night. You got to realize that, you know, that's one way to look at it. The way I look at it is all they can say is no. And, you know, I've heard no enough in a bunch of different contexts that it's okay. It's a word. It means you're not, it's not going to be easy. You're on to the next thing. That's fine. So there's one of it. The second part is, I do see it, and especially in New York, that young people, younger people, and I I guess they call them millennials, I don't know. I I read the same trend stories everybody else does. Mm -hmm. But I see a sort of entitlement where they won't go back to the provinces and be night cops, that they should be writing for the New York Times now, and they shouldn't really just be doing Metro. They should be writing essays about it about what's going on in the world. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of an overblown sense of themselves. And most of these people are very bright and will get to the jobs that they want. But I think there's been a reluctance to go through the fundamentals, to take the shit jobs and work your way up. And when they what may look like shit jobs show you the basics of our craft. And, you know, the basic of our craft is going out, finding stuff and accurately portraying it. And if you have a beat, you learn to work people. You learn to work what a story is and sources. And, you know, something that somebody looks at and thinks is inconsequential you have a different view of because you've talked to three or four different people and you can build that out. And, you know, that, that's what, uh, I guess that's my pet peeve in, in journalism right now is that, uh, you know, people want to call themselves investigative reporters and there are some real ones out there, but in this day and age, I don't think you can just sit there and say, I want to investigate this and, do anything meaningful. I think the greatest news breaking stuff, go back and look at Watergate, uh, you know, look back at, we've got this wonderful woman who's on ISIS right now, Rukmini Kalamani. They know their subject. All these projects go from the bottom up. They bubble up. It's because they know things other people don't know and they're passionate about it and they can tell it. And they can, you know, bring it out. They can pull it out from a piece of ephemera or a piece of obscure knowledge and build out a story and a narrative around it. And I don't see the willingness for people to do the spade work first. It's kind of like what you were saying about the American Pharaoh book was really like a book 40 years in the writing. You know, you were able to pull on that well of just going back to your Midwest roots and having having this deep wealth of horse knowledge and, and it manifests itself in a book that comes out, you know, in 2015. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, now it's easier for me to do. I mean, I've I've shifted in the last year or two to uh, different things as far as uh, news wise, from sexual assaults on campus to the uh, I guess the flim flamness of daily fantasy. And, you know, I didn't have 40 years on either one of those, but I had 30 years of being a reporter who knows how to unearth uh, information and knows how to talk to people. That's the other thing I tell young people is, man, this business is all about listening. Mm -hmm. And if you can talk to people and if you can get them to tell their story, and I'm going to, this is a, a staple story of mine, but it was one of the most informative things ever. When I'm a cub reporter in Dallas, I had to work Sundays and Mother's Day, I don't know, must have been late 80s, mid 80s, uh, two 16 year old twin girls die in a car wreck early that morning. And the weekend editor goes to me, uh, Drape, go out, talk to the family and we need pictures of them. And I think, wow. And I'm petrified. I drive out to Mesquite, Texas, just praying they're not home because I don't even know what to say or how to ask about it. And, you know, I get there. There's tons of cars there. I know they're home. I knock on the door. You know, I'm Joe Drake from the Dallas Morning News. I'm sorry for your loss, but I'd like to talk to you about your daughters. And this mother and father who just had the most devastating thing happen to them pulled me in, sat me down at the kitchen table. Uh, people were bringing me food and they just talked about these two girls because they wanted their story told. And, you know, in the, in the most terrible circumstance, it was important for them to do it. And you sit there and you listen and, you know, it, it, my epiphany was everybody has a story to tell and wants to tell it. And, what you have to do is get it out of them. And some people are very forthcoming. Some people you need to play games with. Most people, you just need to sit and listen and, uh, you get the material out because everybody has a story to tell. Hmm. And when you're, you know, you've got, you're sort of on the coattails of this, of this latest book, you know, you, all, all the great work you do, like what, what excites you and what brings you back to the page and what might you be like working on now that's got you excited in the way that maybe American Pharaoh excited you and you're, you just can't wait to get, get it down on paper. You know, I've got a couple, I got another book that I'm working on that is not going to be a quick turnaround. And it's about how you become a saint in the Amer in the Catholic church. Hmm. And it's a, a massive left turn and it's, far more of a who done it than you know I'm giving it credit for it's not a how to it's just sort of the the behind the scenes machinations and how it works in Rome how it works when you decide here that you think this man or woman is holy and you know it's not as clean it's a lot like running an election you got to go spend a lot of money dig up a lot of stuff and prove at various levels that something's happening. So that's fun reporting wise. I've taken the uh, Black Maestro, which is a book of mine about Jimmy Winkfield, the last black jockey to win the Kentucky Derby. And he did it in 02 and 03. And that was the most boring thing he did in his life. He went to Russia, you know, Hitler took over his farm in France. He's just this kind of like Forrest Gump character. And I've turned that into a pilot and a hopefully a, a limited series drama, like one of those 12 part things that's out there shopping around right now. Mm. Uh, you know, I just like to keep busy, Brendan. I mean, yeah. I like I like doing things and, you know, getting out of my comfort zone and trying to learn. I, I've messed with basically every form of of the written word and, you know. I've been I've been miserable in some, better in others, and uh, still want to keep trying it. Uh, That's great. It seems like what what keeps pulling you back is just this 
it's it's the the boy under the sheet with the flashlight. You're like you're just drawn by story and narrative. That, that that's true. And there's also, I mean, what else? I've done this a long time. What else am I going to do? It's too <laughs> late. It is too late for me to invent an app. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, and the one thing I do regret, and I think you will appreciate this. Uh, Growing up in Kansas City, I had no idea what Wall Street was. And now living up here and realizing Wall Street's just like going to the racetrack, <laughs> that it's gambling. <laughs> I wish I would have had that indoctrination earlier because I think it would have been fun. Mm. Very nice. Well, Joe, thank you so much for carving out some time your morning here. Like you got, I know it's it's coming up on post draw time, so you got to. Got to got to go head over and do that. But uh, th- thanks again for doing this, and uh, I, I can't wait to talk to you again in the future. Brendan, and good luck with all your endeavors. You've written a good book. Just keep moving. Thanks a lot. That means a lot, and uh, definitely uh, we'll be in touch. And have a, have a great Belmont Stakes Day. All right, you too, my friend. All right, later, Joe. All right. Big thanks to Joe Drape for coming by Creative Nonfiction Podcast Headquarters. I love it, baby. I hope you do, too. Now, this episode, like all others, was hosted and produced by me, Brendan O'Mara. Feel free to ping me on Twitter, at Brendan O'Mara, and subscribe to my monthly reading list newsletter at my website, you guessed it, brendanomara.com. Lastly... I've always wanted to start a band. We should totally start a band. My oh, man, let's let's rock and roll this. All right. Till next week when we resume our interviews from the world of creative nonfiction. Thanks for listening.